These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed the habit, found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. So back up into the paragraph. The phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average tempered drinker. Well, that's what, that's what my problem is. I put it in my body and I don't have choice. Once I put one in my body, I'm off to the races. No matter what my brain tells me, I don't have control of my body and my body will tell me when I'm actually done. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol or drugs, in my experience, in any form at all. That is the first delusion that they talk about in more about alcoholism. But the doctor's already describing the first delusion. I can never safely ever put drugs or alcohol in any form in my body ever again. And once having formed the habit, they found they cannot break it. Once having lost their self-confidence or reliance upon things humans, their problems pile up and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Frothy emotional peel seldom suffices. Lots of people don't know what that line means. I work with a lot of people and people that I think would understand that don't understand it. I know a lot of people on this chat tonight will. And what that actually means is no amount of pleading from my kids or my wife or my friends or my boss or anybody. Frothy emotional appeal, the emotional appeal to build, just stop drinking, stop using drugs. You have a family, you have a business, you have all these things going for you. That stuff does not work. It might work for a week, it might work for a month, but eventually I don't have a choice in the matter because I suffer from a spiritual malady and I need relief to my spiritual malady. The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. So what that line means, and that's really important as we work with others. And as I go talk to a new newcomer and we talk about alcoholism, the, the message that can interest and hold this guy must have depth and weight. The depth is experience. I got to share that I'm an alcoholic addict and relate to him, but the weight is what's worked for me. And I'm going to read a little something out of a, a chapter up ahead because this is exactly what it's talking about. So I'm on page 18 and there's a solution. But the ex-problem drinker who has found the solution, who is properly armed with facts about himself, about my disease, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty. That's the depth. He obviously knows what he is talking about. That's the depth. That his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he is the man with the real answer. My whole body language will shout at the new prospect that, that I have a solution that's worked for me. And uh, that he has a no attitude of holier than thou. Nothing whatever but a sincere desire to be helpful. That there are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. So those two paragraphs I just read go exactly with the message that can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. Um, so if you're working with somebody or you're approaching newcomers, you know, always start out with, you know, sharing your experience and, and relating your experience that you're an alcoholic addict. And then, you know, you'll turn, you'll turn the conversation more to the solution. And that's all detailed in the chapter working with others. And I always encourage anyone who's even new to read that because as you're interacting with new people in the program, there's a lot of valuable information working with others because the whole chapter is clear cut directions of what you do and what you don't do. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their lives. And I like that. Bill says in nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in God, a power greater than themselves. 
if they are to recreate their lives. So the people that don't get a God in their life and or they make women God or they make money God, you know, they get drunk. Um, unless they have a, a connection with an actual God of their understanding that's powerful. And like, here's me, okay? Here's alcohol and here's God. It's the only thing more powerful than alcohol and drugs in my life. And I need this connection and I don't need it right off the bat to be solid. I just need a willingness to maybe believe in something, okay? And then the line where it says to re if they are to recreate their life. So for me, it's a recreation of life. I, I'm not living the old life that I had. And I hear a lot of people in the room saying, you know, I just want my life back. I want my life back. Well, if you have God working in your life, you won't want your old life back. Once you have a taste of actual God and what he can do in your life, nothing else will do. And you won't want to ever go back to that old life because that is life of the worldly, meaning non-material. I mean, meaning material. The life with me for like today with God in my life, it's like I said, once you taste upper levels of consciousness with your God and you actually really try to turn over your whole life and will and you see the benefits that come from it and a lot of the shit doesn't make sense as you go through the pain. But trust me, it's a leap of faith and you don't really know until you try it. Most people aren't going to take that full leap and step from bridge to shore because there's so many societal ingrained belief systems. But I'm telling you from my experience, fuck all that shit. Excuse my language. There is. God's amazing. God is amazing. And if you really give him a chance in all areas of your life, you will never pick up a drink again. And that's a promise. And just to reiterate on that exact note, Bill did a, it's on YouTube, it's called Emotional Sobriety. It was a letter that he wrote to the grapevine in 1954. And Bill talks about the relationship with God will be so important that you won't need to be dependent on Alcoholics Anonymous. You won't need to be dependent on the rooms. You won't need to be dependent on anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Why? Because your dependence will come from God. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an amazing letter. If you ever want to look it up, it's called Emotional Sobriety. And this guy picks it apart. It's on YouTube. If any feel a psychiatrist directing for a hospital, uh, directing at a hospital for alcoholics, we appear somewhat sentimental. Let them stand on with us on the firing line. See the tragedies, the despairing wives, the little children. Let the solving of their problems become part of their daily work. And even of their sleeping moments, the most cynical will not wonder that we have accepted and encouraged this movement. We feel after many years, so there's the doctor and the fraternity again, after many years experience that we have found nothing. Double underline. So yeah, they have found nothing which has contributed more to the rehabilitation to these men and their families than the altruistic movement that has now grown up among them. Again, the doctor's just reiterating the facts. I just like you to underline found nothing. Because in my experience, bro, there's nothing that works as good as this book, Alcoholics Anonymous. What makes me say that? Well, the books were written in 1939, 35, Bill Gets Sober. It's written in 39. It's never been changed. But now you take this same book and you transfer it into the over 300 or 350 12-step programs in the world that use the basis of this book. Just think of how many millions of people are, are sober and live really good lives just based on this book. And then I've, I've worked with many people who have tried CBD and tried these different treatment centers and tried all these different things. And the ones who go through the literature properly with a sponsor and understand the mechanics, there's nothing better. There's nothing better. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Of course we do. Fuck. <laughs> The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot after time differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again experience the ease and comfort that comes at once, that comes at once by taking the few drinks, drinks they see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, 
and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of the spree. Emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again, this is repeated over and over and over and over and over. Unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. So I'm going to talk about this. So they are restless, irritable, discontent. This is, to me, this is not a twofold disease, okay? Talk about the twofold disease, the obsession and the allergy. Yeah, great. But this, there's one more that's way more important. And when I treat this part, then I will never have an obsession and I will never put it in my body. And it's the restless, irritable and discontented. And it's first in this stream of, of the alcoholic cycle. And if I can treat the restless, irritable, and discontentedness, which is the spiritual malady, which is the selfish self-centeredness, if I treat that, I will never have an obsession and I will never put a drink in my hand. But when, when I am an untreated alcoholic and I, before I get here, I can look at this and go, yeah, I was agitated. My kids would say stuff. My wife was bugging me about the bills and work's piling up on me and life's just piling up on me and I'm restless, irritable, discontent. Mind you also, my, my go-to is anger and, uh, and frustration. Um, and then, you know, the sense of ease and comfort that comes at once by taking a few drinks. And I think about in my past life, the ease and comfort that I got when I put the first drink in me or the first hoot in me, it just was like everything was okay right now because my brain and my spiritual malady needed so much relief in that moment that I couldn't take it anymore and I succumbed to the desire again. I took the drink, I put it in me, I took the drug, I put it in me and everything was okay right now. For the minute. Drinks that he see others taking with impunity. After they have succumbed to the desire again. As so many do. That's important. The word succumbed means fail to resist. When I'm an untreated alcoholic with a spiritual malady. And, I, and then I get the obsession. Because I need relief right now. I don't actually have a choice. I succumb to the desire again. And that means fail to resist because I won't be able to resist. I can white knuckle only so long. And then eventually I find myself sitting there going, how did this happen? I'm, I'm fucking high. I'm drunk because I succumb to the desire again. I don't have the power. I'm powerless. My drug of choice overpowers me every time. Why? Because I have a spiritual malady. The obsession kicks in and I need relief and I need it now. And boom, it happens that quick. And the problem with me putting it in my body, then the, the phenomenon of craving develops. Because now I put it in me. And I don't have a choice once I put it in me. And then I pass through the well-known stages of the spree. So I go on the spree. I go on a tear. And that tear might be a day. Maybe it's two days. And maybe I even put the drink or the drug down for a day or two in between. But the spree actually hasn't ended in many cases. Which is why I'm drunk again, like the next day or, or two days later. Because the spree is very sneaky. I'm emerging remorseful. Yeah, I swear off. I've caused a lot of pain and I feel the guilt and I don't want to do this anymore. And I really want to stop. And I emerge remorseful. And then I make a firm resolution not to drink again. So in my own experience as a crackhead, I remember... That cycle kicking in and every single day I would drive down this back gravel road out by Chestermere and I'd roll down my window and I'd throw my craft pipe out the window. And every single day I did that for like three years. There's probably about 1,500 craft pipes in the ditch between Glenmore Trail and Chestermere because I couldn't stop. No matter what, I would always I succumb to the desire again because I didn't have a solution. My sol and I tried willpower. I tried everything. But every day, it was the same old Groundhog Day. Um, with the firm resolution not to drink again. And this was repeated over and over and over. Unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there is very little hope of his recovery. On the other hand, and strange as this may seem to, to those who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, that very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he ever despaired of solving, them suddenly finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol. Okay, 
with a full psychic change, we don't need to white knuckle. We will be a easily able to control our desire for alcohol or a drug. The only effort, there's effort, and that means there's work, there's directions to follow. Is that being required? Required is important. It's a necessity. It's a non-negotiable. Required to follow a few simple rules. And when you dissect that last sentence, it's, it's, there's no gray area. You know, if you want to not have the obsession and, and be a, a, a slave to your drink or drug, then you have to re being required to follow a few simple rules. And it's very mechanical. You follow the mechanics and the result is, is what we just read. So if you've been around a while and maybe you're struggling with certain defects or maybe you've been around the program a while and you're just like, why ain't I feeling better? Like, is this all there is? No, there's, that's not all there is. There's more. And through this, through this alcoholic cycle that we just read, restless, irritable, and discontent, the sense of ease and comfort what comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks as they see others taken with impunity, after they have succumbed to the desire again, as so many do, phenomenon of craving develops, pass through one on stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over. Okay, now, the drink and the drugs are taken away. Maybe you got some time in, but you're still kind of struggling with life, and maybe you haven't identified all your defects of character. Um... As an alcoholic that lived this alcoholic cycle with no drugs or alcohol, when I get restless, irritable, and discontent, I will put women in there. And I get ease and comfort that comes at once by having a woman in my life or just having sex. And it, and it gives me comfort and it gives me relief to my alcoholism right now. And even the restless, irritable, discontented, the chase of the woman is also exhilarating and I get some type of relief. But the problem is, is it frustrates me because it doesn't go the way I want and it builds the spiritual malady up even more. And then as I, as I find somebody, and I can use anger in there, I can use greed in there, I can use gambling in there, I can use self-pity in there because there's a perverse pleasure that we get out of self-pity. As I put whatever defect in that alcoholic cycle when I'm restless, irritable, and discontent, I get relief now, okay? Drinks that they see others taking after they have succumbed to the desire again. And I like that, succumb to the desire again. I don't have a choice. If I don't treat my spiritual malady and start working hard at this program, I'm going to keep suffering because once the drink and the drugs are removed, I'm still not going to be totally happy because I'm acting out in self, selfish, self-centered behavior. And I don't have a choice in the matter, which is why step six is so important because I become entirely willing to work towards perfection and, and ask God to help me. But I got to do the work too, right? But it doesn't seem like it's the right thing to do sometimes because it seems like, well, why are these other guys all getting laid and acting in anger and doing all these things when I, and I don't get to? Well, how recovered do you want to be? That's the bottom line. So after you succumb to the desire again to act in a defect and get relief, as so many do, the phenomenon of craving develops and they pass through the well-known stages of a spree. So you go on a spree. And I know many sponsees that will start, they'll do really good for a while and then the desire for sex comes up so bad and they can't stop it and then they're on Tinder and then they have sex with one woman and then they're on a spree, okay? And they're on a spree and they can't stop. But after every woman, these guys, you know, emerge remorseful because they know what's wrong and they don't want to do it, but they can't stop because they set off a different type of spree because the alcoholic always needs relief. And it's the same thing with anger. I get power out of anger and I will, I will act in anger. I will succumb to the desire again, as so many do. And then I'm off to the races on sprees of anger. And then I emerge remorseful because I didn't want to yell at those people or my kids or whatever. With a firm resolution not to do it again. Not to be angry again. Not to be lustful again. Not to gamble again. Not to live in self-pity again. Whatever it is. Um, and this is repeated over and over and over and over unless I can have an entire psychic change. 
And that is what we're talking about, about turning our whole will in our lives over, understanding the actual mechanics of the steps. And step six is what I'm actually talking about, being willing. And it's worked through my step 10. And that's why a lot of people aren't really content and happy, in my opinion, in the program, because they just put other things in the alcoholic cycle. And it still causes inner turmoil within yourself. And when you cause so much inner turmoil in yourself, you can't find true vitality in life. So it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of commitment. And like I said, it doesn't always feel like it's the right thing to do because society's told us a story that this is what we should live. And I'm telling you that it's, it's a lie and it's, and it's a little bit different. And you can have those things, but you have them with a different, a different motive. And the program teaches me it's never about intention. It's always about motive. Never intention, always motive. Okay, so your typical human being in general, because the alcoholic is the most extreme example of self-will run riot, but not the only example. So for me in my life, and I uncover this through my own experience, I can go out into life with the best of intention, okay? I can go out and not really want to hurt somebody or, or, or like um, manipulate them or, but if I just look at intention, I have to peel back the layers of intention and I see motive. And when I understand the motive, where does the motive come? Okay, I'm going to use women for an example because this, the, you know, in my 14 month mark, I didn't want to hurt anybody. And I started seeing this one woman and I totally didn't want to hurt her. And, um, and that was my intention. And I believed it. And you can put me on a lie detector test and, and I didn't want to hurt that person. And then as the relationship progressed, you know, she ended up getting hurt. And then when I sat and did inventory on it, my sponsor's like, it doesn't, he didn't say this, but it didn't matter what my intention was because I rationalize and justify everything. When I peeled it back, I had a desire for sex relation and emotional security. And I was self-seeking the relationship to fulfill those things. Even though I told her that I was never going to stay with her long term. And so I hurt her. But my intentions were not. But my motives were, were of, of uh, not pure motive. So I'm going to get going here. I am going to start on the second paragraph on XXIX. So on the other hand. As strange as this may seem, who do not understand, once a psychic change has occurred, the very same person who seemed doomed, who had so many problems he ever despaired of solving them, finally finds himself easily able to control his desire for alcohol, or lust, or anger, or whatever. The only effort necessary is that being required to follow a few simple rules. And to me, step 10 is the gold mine to that alcoholic cycle and defect to character cycle because when you first get here you're treating alcoholism with the drug or the drink but once you put the drink and the drug down you're gonna you're gonna treat your alcoholism with defects of character and you're not gonna feel as good as you want to feel and then you're gonna think is this all there is but no and as we our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives Step 10 clears the motives and it levels up my consciousness, gets me more in conscious contact with God. Once I start understanding, it's not about intention, it's about motive. Men have cried out to me in sincere and despairing appeal. Doctor, I cannot go on like this. I have everything to live for. I must stop, but I cannot. You must help me. Faced with this problem, if a doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Though the aggregate of recoveries resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit that we have made little oppression upon the problem as a whole. So I'm just going to touch on that, and I don't usually touch on this, but I will tonight. So one feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. Yes though the aggregate of recoveries. So the, the word aggregate means a total combined. It means a collective. 
of recovery, so CBD and all these other types of mental aspects of trying to control it through, through your mind. Though the aggregate combined of recovery resulting from psychiatric effort is considerable, we physicians must admit that they have made little impression upon the problem as a whole. And that's the truth, you know, um, psychological measures using willpower, using control of the mind, it doesn't really work in the doctors, that's what he's actually saying. Many types do not respond to the ordinary psychological approach. So he's just reiterating what I just said. I do not hold with those who believe that alcoholism is entirely a problem of mental control. I have had many men who had, for example, worked a period of months on a problem or business deal, which was to be settled a certain date favorably to them. They took a drink or so, they took a drink a day or so prior to the date, and then the phenomenon of craving at once became paramount to all other interests so that the important appointment was not met. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. And I like that line, and that's a double underline. These men were not drinking to escape. They were drinking to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. So once the phenomenon of craving is kicked in, you're not drinking to escape, right? You drink to overcome a craving bodily craving beyond your mental control which is why it's so important when I work with somebody that they get five days why because they can tell me on day one that they're gonna stop they can tell me on day two that they're gonna stop but the obsession is so powerful and the restless irritable and discontentment and the obsession is so powerful um, that they don't really have a choice like I don't know how many times I've I've talked with somebody and I've seen them on day one or day two back in a meeting and they're like, yeah, dude, I'm here for good this time. I've had enough. And I'm like, dude, you can't say that. You cannot say that. Why? Because the fucking alcohol and drugs will tell you when you're done. You don't tell alcohol and drugs when they're done with you. They tell you when they're done with you. And unless you get a real sense of desperation and your ego and your spirit are both beaten to a pulp, you're not done. So these men are not drinking to escape. They drink to overcome a craving beyond their mental control. My brain has no part in saying what's happening. My body actually runs the show. The drink is done with me when the drink decides it's done with me. There are many situations which arise out of the phenomenon of craving, which cause make men to make the supreme sacrifice rather than continue to fight. And the supreme sacrifice is actually death. And anyone who can't um, fathom the actual death, because some of us don't get there, but if we kept going, we probably would get there. But what I like to highlight here is I was dead inside for years before I ever made it here. I looked in the mirror and I looked like a shell of a human being and I was dead inside. And I think that's actually worse than actually dying. Who wants to exist in that, that type of shape? Not happy, not content, knowing, knowing you're just a shell of a human being. So I'm still making the supreme sacrifice. I'm dead inside. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip to page 136 to just kind of emphasize this point. So if you wouldn't mind flipping to page 136 or listening... So I'm going to start at the bottom paragraph on 136, and I'm going to read a few paragraphs. My secretary returned to say that it was not Mr. B on the phone. It was, it was Mr. B's brother, and he wished to give me a message. I still expected a plea for clemency, but these words came through the receiver. I just wanted to tell you, Paul jumped from a hotel window in Hartford last Saturday. He left us a note saying you were the best boss he ever had and that you were not to blame in any way. Another time, I, as I opened the letter which lay on my desk, a newspaper clipping fell out. It was the obituary of one of the best salesmen I have ever had. After two weeks of drinking, he had placed his toe on the trigger of a loaded shotgun. The barrel was in his mouth. I had discharged him for drinking six weeks before. Still another experience, a woman's voice came faintly over long distance from Virginia. She wanted to know if her husband's company insurance was still in force, four days before he had hanged himself in his woodshed. 
I had been obliged to discharge him for drinking, though he was a brilliant, alert, and one of the best organizers I have ever known. That's it. And that's, that's what happens. Like, this is a fatal progressive illness. And people die all the time. I just had a sponsee who fired me about eight or nine months ago. He just died about two months ago. Why? Because he wouldn't work on the selfish self-centeredness. He wouldn't work on his defective character of his insecurity to be alone. And every man that I work with, when they relapse, it's always, almost always, a woman. And then dishonesty kicks in. And, and if, unless we're now willing to work hard at the elimination of the worst of these defects, both sobriety and peace of mind will still elude us. And oftentimes, selfish self-centeredness, we must be rid of it or it kills us. And that's the truth. And people die all the time. There was a guy I just saw his picture the other day. He just died on March 22nd. And I know tons of people that die from this disease. Which is why I'm the way I am. Which is why I'm doing this study today. Because this disease is a killer. And why I focus on the design for living and the defective character is because if you are going to stay sober, then I want you to live a good life. And you have a way better chance of staying sober if you understand the design for living aspect of this program. But in Alcoholics Anonymous and Cocaine Anonymous and these rooms that I go to, when we, we just talk about the, the drink. But I think we're missing the boat. We need to talk about the spiritual malady and how to, how to medicate the spiritual malady with God and, and understand the alcoholic cycle with the defects of character and these types of things more so than the drink sometimes. And when you look at the boards for birthdays, there's always one year and two years and then there's big gaps and then it's 10 years. Why? Because your typical new person is not going to follow the directions. They're just here to get sober and they think they got this. But they don't got this. Which is why there's no one staying sober in the three and four and five and six years. Because they quit talking to their sponsor. They quit praying. They quit following the disciplines. They get on with life on the business of being self-satisfied. And then they drink again. And uh, I don't know what happens to them all. But, you know. Anyway. So, the classification of alcoholics seems most difficult and in much detail is outside the scope of this book. There, there are, of course, the psychopaths who are emotionally unstable. We are all familiar with this type. They are always going on the wagon for keeps. They are over-remorseful and make many resolutions but never a decision. There is the type of man who is unwilling to admit that he cannot take a drink. He plans various ways of drinking. He changes his brand or his environment. There is the type who always believes that after being entirely free from alcohol for a period of time, he can take a drink without danger. There is the manic depressive type, who is perhaps the least understood by his friends, and about whom a whole chapter can be written. There are the types entirely normal in every respect, except in the effect alcohol has upon them. They are often able, intelligent, and friendly people. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter which one of these you are. It doesn't matter. It's like this piece of the doctor's opinion is pretty much pointless. Why? Because all these and many others have one symptom in common. They cannot start drinking without developing the phenomenon of craving. That's the bottom line. So it doesn't matter which one of these you are. If you develop a phenomenon of craving, you're in big fucking trouble. And we got a solution though. Um, and that's why we hope these pages will prove so convincing that no further authentication is necessary. Relate honestly with the literature and you don't need to go back out and check it out again and do some more step one research. Your research can be done in the first 51 pages of this book. Um, the phenomenon, as we have suggested, may be the manifestation of an allergy, which differentiates these people and sets them apart as a distinct entity. And that's important. I'm a distinct entity. I will not ever be a non-alcoholic or a non-drug addict. When I accept the fact that I am an alcoholic drug addict and it's never going away, and I accept it willingly, I'm on the right track. But if there's a part of me that, that has a lurking notion that maybe I'm not, I'm probably not on the right track. I'm a distinct entity. 
Um, it has never been by any treatment of which we are familiar permanently eradicated. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. I want you to remember this line. The only relief we have to suggest is entire abstinence. And like really remember that because I'm going to talk about the design for living step one, two, and three at some point in this, in this uh, process. And that is going to be of top priority rating. This immediately precipitates us into a seething cauldron of debate, much has already been written pro and con, but among physicians the general opinion seems to be that most chronic alcoholics are doomed. And I like the definition of doomed. And like in the book, that as you go through the literature, the word doomed, you know, yeah it sounds bad, but when you actually know what the word is, it is certain to fail, die or be destroyed. Certain to fail, to die or be destroyed is what doomed actually means. And uh, that's the truth. You look at, you look at alcoholics. They're, they're certain to fail. A lot of them are dead. Or if they're not dead, they're, they're emotionally and mentally destroyed. What is the solution? Question mark. Perhaps I can best answer this by relating one of my experiences. About one year prior to this experience, a man was brought in to be treated for chronic alcoholism. He had but partially recovered from a gastric hemorrhage and seemed to be a case of pathological mental deterioration. He had lost everything worthwhile in life and was only living, one might say, to drink. He frankly admitted that he believed for him there was no hope. Following the elimination of alcohol, there was found to be no permanent brain injury. He accepted the plan outlined in this book plan. He accepted the directions and the disciplines outlined in this book. Okay, let's see what happened to him. A year later, he called to see me and I experienced a very strange sensation. I knew the man by name and partly recognized his features, but there all resemblance ended. From a trembling, despairing, nervous wreck, when he came in, because that's all of us, step zero promises, page 52, had emerged a man brimming over with self-reliance and contentment. I talked with him for some time but was not able to bring myself to feel that I had known him before. To me, he was a stranger, and so he left me. A long time has passed with no return to alcohol. When I need a mental uplift, I often think of another case brought in by a physician prominent in New York. The patient had made his own diagnosis and deciding a situation hopeless, had hidden in a deserted bar and determined to die. He was rescued by a searching party and in desperate condition brought to me. Following his physical rehabilitation, he had a talk with me in which he frankly stated he thought the treatment was a waste of effort, unless I could assure him, which no one ever had, that in the future he would have the willpower to resist the impulse to drink. His alcoholic problem was so complex, his depression was so great, that we felt his only hope would be through what we called then moral psychology. And we doubted that even that would take any effect. However, he did become sold on the ideas contained in the book. Sold on the ideas contained in this book. Precisely laid out, step by step, clear cut directions. He has not had a drink for a great many years. I see him now and then and he is a fine specimen of manhood as one can wish to meet. Yeah, because when you follow the directions and this is a design for living, you turn into a fine specimen of manhood or womanhood that anyone would like to meet. I earnestly advise every alcoholic to read this book through and through. Perhaps he came to scoff, he may remain to pray. William D. Silkworth, MD. So I will come back to Bill's story probably at the very last session of the Big Book Study. Reason being is because I want, to, I want to pull the whole of Bill's story into the program. Because the whole program is in Bill's story and, and I really like to do that later. Um, and Typically with a new guy I'm skipping Bill's story. Because I need to get to there's a solution. And I know there's a lot of value in Bill's story. But with a brand new guy I'm going right to there's a solution. Because I need him to relate. But with, if I'm working with a retread or somebody that keeps coming back, keeps coming back, keeps coming back, I go into Bill's story. Why? Because it talks about working with others like five times. 
and it talks about the spiritual, it talks about God, it talks about the, all the steps. So I really, really hammer the uh, working with others and I hammer the, the God and I hand, hammer the steps because the last half of Bill's story is just loaded with goodies that typically a relapser is not doing. So it depends on the person, but you know, two different scenarios is what I gave you, but I usually base it on the person that I'm working with and what I believe their needs are. Thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered, they solved the drink problem. We are average Americans. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who would normally not mix, but there exists among us a fellowship of friendliness and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. We are like the passengers of the great liner, the moment after rescue from shipwreck, when camaraderie, joyousness, and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement that binds us, but that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. So I'm just going back up uh, middle of the main paragraph. We are people who would normally not mix. But there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, and an understanding which is indescribably wonderful. Yeah, we're people who would not mix. What, what mixes us is the depth. You know, the depth. You're an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm going to say on this page, we're going to talk about two things. There's not one fellowship. There's two. Okay. The first fellowship is Tradition 3 Fellowship. Most people are inclusive of the step of tradition three fellowship. You have a desire not to drink or use. I have a desire not to drink or use. That's great. Okay. There's another fellowship. It's called the fellowship of the spirit. And we'll talk about that as we read. So we are like the passengers of a great liner. The moment after rescue from shipwreck where camaraderie, joyousness and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to captain's table. Steerage means the bottom of the boat. Captain's table means the very top where the captain and all the rich people are, and everyone in between. We are people who would normally not mix. Unlike the feeling of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement that binds us. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. That is tradition three. We're talking about tradition three, just being an alcoholic addict and, and so are you. Okay? It's funny how you got a, such a wide variety of people that are sober for years but miserable and people that are sober for years and really happy and people that are, have like two or three or four years that are really happy, they seem on the beam and they're talking about God and their recovery. And then others that have two or three or five years that aren't happy. And like there's a wide variation of the joy and happiness within the rooms itself. Why? Because we focus on the substance. We don't focus on the design for living. And a lot of people don't understand the mechanics. A lot of people in the programs base this program on a theory. And if I, if I base this book on a theory where I, I get moral and philosophically comforted, then I'm not going to grow. I'm just going to, this is going to be a long road. Um, we talk about guys in the program and this isn't here to discredit anyone. I'm just giving you my perspective to try to help uh, promote you to dig in. We talk about, well, you know, I go into life and I practice all these principles in my affairs and that's the main thing. Okay. If, you, if you're an alcoholic that doesn't understand these directions and you don't understand the selfish, self-centered nature, and yeah, you maybe have done the steps, but you haven't really identified really what the problem is and the selfish, self-centered, not based on intention, but based out of motive, you go into life and you're, you get into a situation where um, you're self-willing a principle. You are still running the show. Okay, I'm in an argument. I'm going to be in an argument. I can feel the frustration building and I'm, and I say something and then I'm like, you know what? I got to get out of here. And I tell the guy, you know what? I've had enough of you. I'm out of here. And then I leave and I call my sponsor and I'm like, yeah, dude, I just practiced the principles in my affair. And my sponsor goes, oh, good job. Good job. 
really, I, all I did was self-will my principle that I rationalized into my head. Yeah, okay, maybe it could have gotten a lot worse, but I didn't follow the directions. Now, in that exact situation where I'm going to be in an argument, if I'm following step 10, I'm aware of selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. I realize I'm angry. In that moment, I go to God. I ask God to help me. And then I'm, I'm aware and I'm asking God for help. And then it says I talk to someone immediately. I step aside. I go call my sponsor. I find some damage or unsaleable good with his help and I discard it without regret. I don't need to make the amend. And then I resolutely turn my thoughts to someone I can help because that's the last piece of step 10. And then I'm now praying for this person. And what was the result through the mechanics of that process is the principle is the result. And in step 10, it's a promise. I've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Not only am I placed in a position of neutrality from alcohol, because I'm not letting shit pile up on me, I'm placed in a position of neutrality with my fellow man, because I'm not fighting anyone or anything. And if I don't fight anyone or anything, then I'm not going to want to pick up a drink. So that's very important. So we don't just practice the principles in our affairs by self-will. We follow the directions and the result is always the principle. The mechanics, result, principle, always. The tremendous fact for every one of us is that we have discovered a common solution. We have a way out which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action. There's the key. Brotherly and harmonious action action that tells me um that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined we're talking about the fellowship of the spirit and i've connected these dots myself no one's told me this but this is my belief that i have a way out which i can absolutely agree upon which i can join in brotherly and the principle behind it is love brotherly love and harmonious action i'm packing the best of me and the best i can do into life for the harmony of life. But if I haven't done the work in this program, I'm not going to be brotherly love. I might do things nice for intention, but my motive is still not pure. And I'm not going to pack into the stream of life harmony. I'm going to do it because I'm supposed to, right? And what I want to do is get you to flip to page 164 so I can just hammer home this point. And it's the very last paragraph of... 164. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Step three. Admit your faults to him and your fellows. Step four and five. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Steps eight and nine. Give freely of what you find. Step 12. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the spirit. And you will surely meet some of us. Very important. Bill only puts this one spot in the book and it's right here. You will surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. And this isn't here to, to you know, um, superiority or nothing. I'm showing you the facts. Bill W. wrote it himself. It says not everyone's going to meet everybody who's in the fellowship of the Spirit. The fellowship of the Spirit actually takes a lot of work to live in. But, you know, um, yeah, I didn't use today. That's enough. I was a fucking asshole all day long, but I didn't use today. So check mark. You know, I think there's way more than that. There's way more than that. This fellowship of the Spirit, true um, altruism and genuine humility are actually, in my opinion, what this actual book's promises are based on. And then when I hit this stage, I can actually practice brotherly love with no intention. It's, it's, uh, it's just unconditional love for my fellow human being. And I'm able to make the harmony of life way better. This is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. I love how Bill writes this next paragraph. An illness of this sort, and we have come to believe it is an illness. Look at how he wrote that. An illness of this sort, and then he puts a hyphen, and we have come to believe it is an illness. I have to come to believe 
that I actually have an illness. And then once I come to believe and I understand that I have this illness, to me it's my responsibility to treat my illness. Because what we're going to read here is the result if I don't treat my illness. And even when I put the drink and the drug away, still a lot of these things in the next paragraph are going to come to fruition because I'm going to treat my illness with defects of character. So once I understand these things and I put the effort into my 6 and my 7 and my 10, 11 and 12, these, these things don't happen. So as I come to believe I have an illness and I take responsibility, involves those about us no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, we are all sorry for him and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness, for with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. And I like that. For me, annihilation of the things that are worthwhile in life were like watching hockey games, jumping on the trampoline with my kids, barbecuing, going for drives down on the beach at Chestermere Lake with my kids, um, playing with the dog and throwing the ball. Annihilation of all those things that were fun, having family times. Annihilation. Look at the word that he uses, man. It engulfs all those who touch the sufferers engulfs it's like it's just like a, a fire it brings misunderstanding fierce resentment financial insecurity disgusted friends and employers warped lives of blameless children sad wives and parents anyone can increase this list and these things can still happen once i put the drink and the drug down if i'm not treating my alcoholism with god because i'll treat it with defects of character we hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are or may be affected. There are many highly competent psychiatrists who have dealt with us found that it's sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss a situation without reserve. Strangely enough, wives, parents and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do the psychiatrist and the doctor. But the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution who is properly armed with facts about himself can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. That the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty. So now what I want to kind of talk to you guys about anyone in the design for living aspect, I want you to read this in the design for living aspect. Maybe I'm a man that struggles with lust. Well, I've had the same problem. I get many sponsees coming to me to work on the sex conduct issue because that's my experience. I also have a lot of guys coming to me to work on anger, right? And I don't get a lot of newcomer sponsees anymore. A lot of my sponsees are guys that have one year or 40 years. And because I'm a student of the book, they, they seem to think that I, I'm able to help them, of which I am. Because I have all the same problems that we all have. And I'm driven by sex relation, emotional, material security, and companionship. Like every other human being. And every defect I have stems from those four desires. Of which is on the first page and a half of step four in the 12 and 12. And when I understand that stuff, it's, it's pretty important. So designed for living, it can be the alcohol or it can be the defect of character. Okay. The same man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty, that he obviously knows what he is talking about, that his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he is the man with the real answer. He has a no attitude of holier than thou, nothing whatever but a sincere desire to be helpful, and that there are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, and no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. Okay, I'm going to rewind four lines. There are no fees to pay. So the guys that I work with, I tell them, yeah, dude, there is fees to pay. The fee that you pay is when we get through these steps, you pass this on. That is the debt that I pay back to the fellowship and program that saved my life. And I implore on my sponsees that the debt that you pay back is, is the same one that I pay. This place saved my life because to me it's my duty, it's my obligation to my fellows. And as I do this work, I, I, I live in altruism. And I start getting the real gifts that this book and this program has to offer. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. We feel that the elimination of our drinking is but a beginning, double underline. 
And when you start understanding the way Bill writes, he, all through his literature, he always hammers home two things. Boom, boom. It's the same point, but he does it twice in two different ways. So we feel the elimination of our drinking is just the beginning. That's the first of two. That's the first punch. And to me, that's important because it is. The elimination of drinking is only the beginning because that's not really the problem. That's not really the problem. It's the solution. But when the solution turns into the problem and I can't stop, I have to relieve myself of that. And that's exactly what this book will do. And this is important. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and all of our affairs. Yeah. So Bill's telling me it's way more important for me to practice these principles everywhere else than here. And how do I do that? I understand step 10. I understand selfish self-centeredness. I understand that if I'm not rid of this thing, I'm going to be living in a lot of pain because I'm going to keep hurting myself and keep hurting others. And when I keep hurting myself deep inside of me, I do this and then, then I don't feel good. So all of us spend much of our time, spare time in the sort of effort which we're going to describe a few are fortunate enough to be so situated that they can give nearly all of their time to the work. If we keep on the way we are going, there is little, little doubt that much good will result. But the surface of the problem would hardly be scratched. There's the second punch home. The surface of the problem is hardly scratched. Those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that close by hundreds, thousands now, are dropping into oblivion every day. Many could recover if they had the opportunity we have enjoyed. So I, I like to use that line right there when I'm working with somebody new because a lot of newcomers come in here and they think this is a life sentence. What does my life come to? And I'm like, dude, you know how lucky you are? Do you have any idea how many thousands and millions of people are dying out there from this disease every day? Do you know you just hit the jackpot? How lucky are you to, to find a place where you can stop drinking and live a beautiful, good life? I said, man, you turn that frown upside down and it should be gratitude, man. And maybe it's not gratitude at the point, but at least when I say these things, it, it starts tweaking them and they start going, yeah, maybe this guy's right. So part of the psychic change, you know, I try to help that along by doing things like that. How then shall we present what has so freely been given to us? So to me, I expect an answer from my sponsee at the time this line is read because there's a question mark. So I ask somebody, somebody answer this. How then shall we present that which has so freely been given us? If I've done my job as a sponsor and we get to this line and they answer that line correctly in my, my sponsorship, then I've done my job because I've hammered that home all through this process. We have concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. We shall bring to task our combined experience and knowledge. This should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. Of necessity, there will have to be discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware that these matters from their very nature are controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or argument. We shall do our utmost to achieve that ideal. So I'm going to stop there for a second. So I'm going to take the next line, two lines, totally out of context, but this is my experience. So double underline, basically, most of us sense that real tolerance, right to the next page, um, help meet their needs. What Bill W. is talking about here is he's, you know, of necessity there's going to have to be all these types of discussions. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which contain no basis for contention or argument. He's going to talk about uh, being tolerant of, of other things. But what I want to highlight here, more so than the context that the book has written, is most of us sense that real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and respect for their opinions are attitudes which make us more useful to others. Just period, in your own life. If you can remember this line, having respect, real tolerance for other people's shortcomings, other people's behaviors and what they do, 
I am to have tolerance for that because they're just another human being who, who do the same things we all do, right? And, and their viewpoints. Everyone has a viewpoint. Everyone has their journey in life and everyone has a, a viewpoint based on their journey in life and respect for their opinions. I don't need to combat your opinion with my opinion. I don't need to always open my mouth and tell you something or judge you. And if I can follow this stuff right here, it will make me more useful to others. And I'm not fighting everyone and everything. And I start understanding that all human beings have the same four natural desires. Sex, relation, emotional, material, security, and companionship. And when I expand on those later in this, this study, this line just is so important to understand and try to implement in our life. And then our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends on our constant thought of others and how we may help meet their needs. So my very life as an ex-problem drinker depends on what this line says. How my, may I serve you, right? But it doesn't make sense. And we'll talk about things not making sense um, later. You may have already asked yourself, why is it that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless you are curious to discover how and the why in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you're an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? While it is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically, we shall tell you what we have done before going into a detailed discussion. It may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times have people have said to us, I can take it or leave it alone, why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman and quit? And that fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't, you, why don't you try beer and wine, lay off the hard stuff? His willpower must be weak, he could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl, I think he'd stop for her sake. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now these are commonplace observations on drinkers which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different than, than ours. And what I like to talk about here is back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different than ours. I, I don't go talk to a non-alcoholic about my alcoholic life. Okay, I don't go talk to like my mom about some of the decisions that I'm going to make in my life because behind her is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding and she doesn't really understand how the alcoholic mind thinks. She doesn't understand the selfish self-centeredness of the alcoholic. And I'm going to I'm going to go talk to her and she's going to tell me something that makes sense to her, but it doesn't it doesn't serve me. I need to talk to God-centered 12-stepped alcoholics who are centered in God. So that I can get direct counsel. 